Welcome back to the study on the Gospel of Matthew. We are at chapter 9 with the story of the raising up of Jairus' daughter. Matthew chapter 9 verse 25 After the crowd had been put outside, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. Mark's Gospel gives us more insight on what happened. In Mark chapter 5 verse 41 onwards, And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straight away the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Now let's look at this in detail. Was the girl resurrected? Well, she was definitely raised up from the dead, but resurrection is much more than just being raised up from the dead. I would say she was resuscitated rather than resurrected. This included Lazarus too. Lazarus was resuscitated. Resurrection is more than just coming back to life. Resurrection is where our physical bodies will be transformed into glorious bodies that will never again die. In this aspect, Jairus' daughter and Lazarus would have died a physical death again and are still in the grave waiting for the resurrection. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 onwards, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to him. Note that some Old Testament saints have already been resurrected after Jesus was resurrected. We see this in Matthew chapter 27 verse 50 onwards. When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. At that moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, When they had come out of the tombs, they entered the holy city and appeared to many people. Note that they resurrected after Jesus' resurrection because Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. So unlike resuscitation, resurrection involves a transformation. So what happens at the resurrection? In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 35 onwards, we read, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? You fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that will be, but just as a seed perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has designed, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one degree, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is of another. The sun has one degree of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and the stars differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam a life-giving spirit. The spiritual, however, was not first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was of dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, 
so also are those who are of the earth, and as if the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so also shall we bear the likeness of the heavenly man. Now I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must be clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that it is written will come to pass. Death has been swallowed up in victory. So at the resurrection, our earthly bodies will be transformed into glorified bodies, eternal bodies that are not subject to death. That is encouraging news. And Jairus' daughter has not yet been resurrected. She was simply resuscitated. Now let's read the verse again from the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 5 verse 41 says, And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Now, in which language did Jesus say Talitha kumi? The majority of the scholars say that Jesus spoke Aramaic and that this phrase is in Aramaic. But did Jesus primarily speak in Hebrew or in Aramaic, as depicted in Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ? I believe that Jesus spoke in Hebrew mostly. Oh yes, he would have known Aramaic, Greek and Latin, but his primary language would have been Hebrew and not Aramaic. But is this true for the majority of the Jews living in Israel at the time as well? Well, there is more proof from the Bible and from history that they converse in Hebrew mostly rather than Aramaic. Let's look at some proof texts from the New Testament. When Paul was giving his testimony to King Agrippa, he mentioned that Jesus spoke to him in Hebrew. In Acts chapter 26 verse 14, And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew, which is Hebraidi in Greek tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Unfortunately, most newer translations wrongly translate this as Aramaic, as in the NIV translation. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. The language of the common people in Israel at that time was Hebrew and not Aramaic, as can be seen on the sign on Jesus' cross which Pilate ordered to be posted, as seen in John chapter 19 verse 20. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Notice the first language used is Hebrew and not Aramaic. Even in this passage, the NIV and other newer translations intentionally mistranslates this based on the biases of the translators. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. Jesus was born Jewish, followed the Torah laws, and spoke in Hebrew. It is unfortunate that translators have depicted him as either Greek or Syrian. The New Testament is a very Jewish book. We will not be able to understand it unless we understand its Jewishness. Coming back to the words Talitha Kumi. So if Jesus spoke in Hebrew, what do the words mean? Here is where it gets interesting. The word kumi in the Hebrew means arise, so that word was translated correctly. It is the word talitha that has been mistranslated. The word talit in the Hebrew means the prayer shawl, so talitha kumi would literally mean prayer shawl arise. In fact, this is a translation that is used in the One New Man Bible translation. And when he took the hand of the child, he said to her, Prayer shall rise. It is unfortunate that when 
writing in the Greek, they were trying to translate Hebrew as though it was Aramaic. The Aramaic word for maiden is Talitha and not Talitha. When we translate the phrase Talitha Kumi as prayer shall arise, it connects the story with the healing of the woman with the issue of blood because as discussed in earlier sessions, there is healing in the wings of the garments of the Messiah. So it was very likely that Jesus places his talit on the body of the little girl of 12 years old and while taking her by the hand orders the talit to arise. Then something like that happened in the tomb. Jesus was shrouded with a linen cloth and during the resurrection Jesus was raised from the dead. Yet the garments around him were still bound. There is strong indication throughout the Bible that there is power that flows through the garments. We had already looked at the woman with the issue of blood touching the seed seats of Jesus' talith and receiving healing. Let's look at other examples. In the Old Testament, we read of a story where Elijah raised a boy, the son of a widow, from the dead. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 19 onwards. But Elijah said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on this widow who has opened her home to me by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, please let this boy's life return to him. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah and the child's life returned to him and he lived. It is possible that by stretching himself over the child, Elijah is literally spreading his talit over the boy and then the boy lives. We know that Elijah's mantle, which was probably his talit since he was Jewish, had power. At the time of Elijah's departure, when he and Elisha travelled from Jericho to Jordan, Elijah took his cloak, which would have been his talit, and struck the water with it. We read this in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 7 onwards. Then a company of 50 of the sons of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing Elijah and Elisha, as the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the waters, which parted to the right and to the left, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Elisha wanted a double portion of Elijah's power before he is taken away, and notice that he does get the power, the power which was there in the mantle. Because we read this in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 13 onwards, Elisha also picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah, and he went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan, then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the waters. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? he asked. And when he had struck the waters, they parted to the right and to the left, and Elisha crossed over. The Hebrew work for cloak or mantle that is used here is adereth, which is also sometimes translated glory. Hmm, no wonder there is power in the mantle. Elisha also raised a boy from the dead in pretty much the same way as Elijah, by stretching himself over the boy. We read this in 2 Kings 4.34. Then Elisha got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eye to eye, and hand to hand. As he stretched himself out over him, the boy's body became warm. Did you know that God has a rope too? That is connected with his glory. We read this in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And did you know that Paul's occupation, as mentioned in the New Testament, is that of a tent maker, which really is that of a prayer shawl maker? And so were Aquila and Priscilla. We read this in Acts chapter 18, verse 3. And he stayed and worked with them because they were tent makers by trade, just as he was. The Bible is amazing. It really comes alive when we understand the Hebrew and its Jewish context. Remember, there is healing in his wings. We run into him and we are safe. Be blessed, folks, and stay inspired in the word. God bless, and until we meet again, Maranatha.